Thanks for joining us in today's discussion, The Art of Workplace Strategy, Data-Driven Design. Leading today's presentation is Mark Allgard with Momentum. Mark works with credit unions, helping them develop workplace and retail network strategies and translate them into high-performing buildings. And joining Mark is Momentum's workplace data partner, Tim Oldman with Leesman. Leesman has developed the world's largest database of workplace effectiveness data. Tim works with teams around the world to help them better understand their daily work activities and how well their workplaces support those activities. Mark, I'll pass things over to you. Great. Thanks, Dana. Today's conversation will take us into the future. It will help you think about how the challenges your organizations face every day are changing and how your office environments could evolve to better support your teams. I know it's an important conversation for me. Spending a third of my waking weekday hours in my office, I need an environment that helps me connect better with my colleagues and really with my collaborators outside of the office. I've read quite a bit about how some really big organizations have transformed their headquarters. Collaborating on this presentation has helped me understand why these organizations have invested in such a transformation. But before we move into our presentation, I'd like to start by asking Tim, why are you challenging the future of credit union workplaces? Uh, hi, Mark, and uh, thanks for the invitation to join you today. So I think this is just one of my, my favorite misquotations. Um, so many people, if, you, if you, uh, you put a slide up of Charles Darwin, would, um, would give you the survival of the fittest as uh, his most famous quotation. He never actually said that. What he said was that uh, survival is about adaptability, and it was the adaptable that survive uh, amongst species. And I think um, we're really seeing in, uh, in a period of such unprecedented change in the financial services industries worldwide, it's not just credit unions, but the, but the whole of the financial services sector is really facing this, this period of such unprecedented change that, that from our perspective and the data that we're collecting, we see this adaptability really is crucial in the, 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 the ongoing growth and development of credit unions and financial services institutes, really driven by their customers increasingly focusing on um, the, the, the retail offer and their relationship with the lender being in the palm of their hands really on, on smartphones and on web enabled devices and I think this is just dramatically changing the infrastructure of an organization and the teams and the people and the departments that it needs in order to to maintain that relationship with its customers so for me everything that we're going to talk about here in, in a, from a data perspective should be, um, will be pointing its finger firmly at this idea of the adaptability of organizations presently. Thanks, Tim. That need to be adaptive is a truly great introduction to this conversation, because with each passing day, the workplace of the past is less and less able to support excellent, responsive teams delivering exceptional customer value and competitive advantage. It's not just credit unions, of course. It's what's going on in workplaces all over the world. Because of their size and ability to make longer-term investments, however, credit unions are in a unique position to adjust. What we know is that the nature of work is changing. Progress in technology is at the base of this shift. But there are other large factors. Rapidly changing worker group demographics, the cost of energy and transportation, and the forces of globalization and societal change. It's a shift both in the way people work and in the outcomes businesses need to stay relevant and competitive. For credit unions, the way people bank has had a huge impact. The need to compete for and connect with members on excellent mobile platforms has drastically changed both the makeup of credit union back office teams and the type of work they perform. Credit unions are investing in teams that integrate financial product design and marketing with information systems and member services. They are engaging on initiatives that look a lot more like projects and much less like routine operations. Fundamentally, the work credit union teams are taking on is more complex and requires a much higher degree of collaboration, innovation, and creativity. The workplaces of the past were designed to support a more hierarchical organizational structure and more process-oriented work. They also didn't incorporate what we know today about the importance of the quality of the physical work environment on culture, engagement, productivity, and performance. I'll tell you this. One of our most frequently fielded questions from our credit union partners is, what do we need to be thinking about? It's a fun question, and to answer it, while you have to be somewhat reflexive, it is absolutely necessary to develop a process to identify beliefs about the future. Part of that process is discarding the idea that what has worked in the past will also work in the future. So here's a recent thread I've chased on the future, virtual reality. Two weeks ago, I was touring Coast Capital's new headquarters in Vancouver, British Columbia, 
when their workplace consultant placed his $200 Samsung VR glasses on my head. He wanted to show me a new workplace concept his team had been working on. I realized that for a few hundred bucks and a special camera, I could help our clients experience different work environments without even leaving their offices. And as I researched the topic, I've learned that virtual reality leads to virtual empathy. There are nonprofits working with refugees who have found that they can rapidly accelerate support from other NGOs by sharing the experience of refugees through virtual reality. It's a tool that people who are really far away from one another can use to connect at a deeper level. It's something that my team can use and invest in to accelerate our results with our clients. And it's something your small business members might want to invest in to build their businesses as well be it virtual reality or 3D printers to prototype products or energy efficiency investments or a litany of other new ways of doing businesses, your members will need money to invest in these products and credit unions are just the right scale to deliver on these needs. Now, as we transition into our conversation, we should probably take just a second to explain who we are just a little bit better. About eight years ago, we were challenged by a credit union team in Indiana to prove it, help us prove to our board of directors that it's important for us to invest in our workplace. One element of this proof was in finding a way to measure the current performance of the workplace and anticipate improvements. What was missing, we discovered, was a baseline, the ability to gauge performance against other workplaces, both average and high-performing. As we began our next credit union headquarters project, we searched for this resource and uncovered Leesman. So Tim, please take a few moments and tell us a bit more about what the Leesman Index is and how it came into being. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So, um, actually, you know, found myself in a similar position back in 2008, 2009, working as a strategist then for um, major UK executive uh, boards um, on some pretty huge capital projects. Uh, the last one around about a £32 million project to reorganize a capital infrastructure for a major UK publishing company, privately owned publisher. And uh, exactly the same situation as, as Mark said, actually, I, I couldn't find anything that would enable me to provide that client with any predictive um, value proposition. And it was very easy to predict the costs, both from a uh, capital investment perspective and an ongoing operational cost perspective, but really almost impossible to provide any way of, of predicting or to measure uh, post-occupancy how that space was actually performing compared to the spaces they were going to be coming from. So. Um, in, a, in a moment of madness, back end of 2009, early 2010, um, started to dig around and see whether there was a business case really for, for me to try and propose this to the, the workplace strategy, uh, interior design, architecture world. Um, and uh, so summer uh, or spring 2009, uh, sorry, spring 2010 launched uh, a concept to the market that was a, a single standardized unified measure of how well workplaces support employees in the role they're employed to do. And uh, by summer 2010, had uh, developed a product, uh, market tested that, um, and started to sort of talk to a, a few prospective clients. And, and by September 2010, really saw a, a, a huge wave of interest in this, this idea of something that could really start to stress test the fitness for purpose of a corporate workplace, not, not from an architecture or a cost perspective, but actually from an employee experience perspective. So to what extent does a workplace support the employee do the job they're employed to do? Um, in, the, in the years since, we've now amassed 165,000 individual employee responses. That, that stretches across around now probably 1,470 workplaces, individual office spaces. Um, and, and that, from a research perspective, is, is an unrivaled uh, data set. There is nobody that comes close to that in terms of its size, consistency, and contemporaneous nature. And of course, everybody who uses the tool now is in effect contributing to the ever-growing uh, strength and stability of that database. So um, more and more organizations measuring their whole portfolios rather than just focusing on individual capital projects. So uh, the guys at Momentum, as, the, as Mark said, found us pretty early on in our life and um, pretty much embedded it in their operational parameters now and similarly with a number of other corporate organizations doing the same so whether you're a client trying to be a better client or you're a design team trying to be a more informed design team the tool has lots of aspects to it that, that deliver on both sides and just at the bottom of that slide you can see this real simple zero to 100 linear scale so every survey at the end outputs this idea of a single number a single measurement of fitness for purpose or effectiveness and uh, enables you to survey both before and after the delivery of a project to report independently back on what that, that project has delivered. Right, Tim. That's what we really love about the tool. 
It's independent and it provides our client with data and insights on their team members because it's team members that are the most important component of a workplace project. It's not so we can build buildings to warehouse them in. So now working with Tim and Rahel and Peggy and L, these experts at Leesman, independently sourced data is a fundamental component of our process in delivering a high performing workplace building. To be high performance, a workplace must help a credit union optimize their team. The workers in that building, they represent up to 90% of its total life cycle cost of operations. We work with our credit union partners to uncover how their operations center can be the best tool towards higher levels of organizational performance. This process starts with a better understanding of work. Work is one of the most defining aspects of our lives. It's where we get to be creative and innovate. It's where we help others learn and perform. It's where we find the common purpose and mission. And in pursuing that mission, it's where we make some of our greatest friends. What I'm describing here are the symptoms of a high-performing workplace. What are some of the symptoms of a dysfunctional workplace? Stress, disruption, posturing, unhealthy competition, hoarding of information, disconnection, and active disengagement. Here's where I throw in my standard caveat. A building is no substitute for a strong culture built on the right behaviors modeled consistently by the organizational leadership. A great workplace will, however, help you model the right behaviors and complete your work in both a productive and satisfying way. We are challenging our credit union partners to look at the way their work is changing and recognize that it will continue to do so, because if it hasn't yet, it will. Then we are asking you to look at the data coming from your teams and the evidence in the world around you to steer your workplace strategy towards a higher level of organizational performance. In today's discussion, when we reference workplace, we're referencing the physical working environment and not the larger operational ecosystem of mission, culture, process, and your team's way of doing things. So let's pause and ask ourselves, in just the last year, what has changed about our work? Did we predict these changes? Could we have? How could we respond? In just four generations, the work of the world transformed. Artisanal work, built on finely honed skills, gave way to manufacturing. In another four generations, the decline of the artisan was complete as work became more regimented and the workplace and work schedule became more compartmentalized and hierarchical. Fordism, it's called. Mass production relied on interchangeable workers with generalized skills, and over the years, this largely filtered into the world of office workers in terms of standard hours, compartmental space, top-down management, and hierarchy. What we know as work, and by that I mean what we do, where we do it, how we do it, and when we do it, is changing, and the change is already well underway. In today's discussion, our approach to the future is framed by the research and writings of Linda Grattan, a professor and researcher at the London Business School. She puts it bluntly when it comes to dealing with the changes in the way we work. Ignore these changes at your peril. What it really comes down to is this. We can no longer imagine the future simply by extrapolating from the past. So, as we imagine the future, we can categorize the elements of future change into five forces. Technology, globalization, demography, society, and natural resources. I'm going to focus on technology and demography because I think they are the most quickly relatable to financial institutions but these are all important things to be thinking about. In terms of globalization, many of you will need to think about how to integrate knowledge workers who were born abroad. The cost of transportation, in terms of time, fuel, and environmental impact will only increase. This should weigh on your decision on both where to establish your home office for the next 20 or more years, but also how often your team members need to travel to this home office to work. As for society, one area to be concerned with is the decline in happiness. An interesting conundrum is, as our standards of living increase, happiness is actually trailing off. Credit unions will need to consider the negative impact technology can have on connectedness between people in the workplace and how this can impact happiness. So as technology becomes more critical to the operation and day-to-day -day mission of credit unions, these forces are having an effect on your workplace. So what are four areas to be thinking about? Well, first, the capability of technology will increase. I'm sure this is pretty obvious to you. The cost of computing will continue to fall. Technology devices will be smaller and more mobile. What does this mean for your workers? Already your employees are largely able to work away from their desks. They now have the ability to work remotely from a branch, from home, or in a temporary collaborative setting. Today, financial institution workers spend roughly 50% of their time at their designated workstations or offices. Executives and managers spend even less time in their offices and workstations. Does it make sense to allocate large blocks of space to be used less than half of the time? Second, your information systems will continue to boost productivity. Core system processing upgrades will shift more process work to automation. 
CRM platforms will become much more sophisticated and it will be easier to match excellent and relevant advice to your members. Third, your team members will connect with each other, members and industry partners digitally. Virtual work platforms will help team members collaborate. Excellent video conferencing tools will increase the value of remote interactions, and they will even be using 3D and hologram technology to make these interactions richer. Social technology participation will increase as well. Self-generated content, job seeking, team collaboration, and instant feedback will all impact both your work output and the way you work. And fourth, your members will demand intuitive and easy access to your financial products, services, and expertise through mobile technology. Big banks will achieve even greater economies of scale through technology than you can reach. This will require that your teams integrate ideas into one cohesive online experience and one that helps you differentiate and compete on a different level. We know that technology has and will continue to substitute for workers performing routine tasks. When it comes to innovation and problem solving, however, technology will not substitute, but it will instead complement and enhance these types of tasks. The challenge will be in finding, attracting, and retaining workers with the mastery in the areas in which your firm wants to innovate and grow. Who do you think were the architects of the organizations many of us experience every day? It was the traditionalists, those born between 1928 and 1945, and who had their largest impact on organizational life between 1960 and 1980. They are largely retired, but their impact in today's workplace lingers. How many of the obstacles you face today even existed in 1980? How about your tools and resources? By 2025, the majority of baby boomers will be out of the workforce as well. Here are your three areas where demographics will have a large impact on the work of credit unions. First, as the baby boomers exit the working world, they will take with them a large amount of knowledge and know-how. Lower birth rates will make skill shortages more prevalent. Credit unions must think about how to deliberately transfer tribal knowledge to the next generation of workers and leaders, and they're going to have to work much harder to attract the right team members. Second, in 2025, millennials will hold the majority of leadership positions. This generation grew up with rapid technology advancement, and they will have a stronger knowledge of and perhaps even admiration for their technology devices and platforms. This generation is also characterized by a stronger aspiration for work-life balance and interesting and stimulating work. In each challenge, there's an opportunity, right? The challenge this generation will face with technology is that it stands to make them feel increasingly isolated and disconnected from other people. But as they grow with the technology, they have the opportunity to harness it to free their time and mental capacity for deeper and richer interpersonal connections. This is an opportunity that you, as credit union leaders, can help the next generation capitalize. And third, people are living longer, but for many, they haven't saved enough money for retirement. This will place a burden on younger populations that aren't growing fast enough to support a larger, older population. It will also result in people working longer and taking on second careers. We will be challenged to create a meaningful work for our older family members, and these populations will be looking to you for a different type of financial product and different form of advice. What we've learned is that you can contemplate the future of work in two ways. There's a default future and a crafted future. The default future is one in which we let technology interrupt our focus work in which technology replaces human-to-human interactions and makes us feel more isolated. A crafted future is one where we steer this technology to make our lives easier. We use it to help us connect with others, to help us decrease stress by reducing commute times, for example, and where we are purposeful in setting aside technology for face-to-face interactions. Why must these interpersonal interactions be so carefully tended in a changing future? Because trust is built on personal relationships. And trust is what gets us out of a state of uncertainty. It's a lubricant to collaboration, to communication, and to getting things done. As economist Robert Reich puts it, we are in the age of the terrific deal. It's easy to find a better deal and switch instantly. If you believe this, then it demands that your credit union continuously improve to retain your membership in business. Your required output has changed. What the art market demands and your need to stay competitive means that decision making has been pushed wider and lower in your organizations. Whenever possible, you are pushing decisions out as closely to your customers as you can. Your mobile platforms have to be excellent, easy, and integrated. Your product margins have gotten smaller, and this means you have to be more competitive and differentiate. Differentiation demands that you are more integrated with your communities and market. It will take all areas of your organization to come together to innovate and create the products and develop the strategies to deliver them to your market. So not only have your work output requirements changed, your ways of working and workplace expectations have changed as well. 
Many organizations are formalizing alternate workplace programs, for example. These are programs that combine non-traditional work practices, settings, and locations. They are facilitated by technology. Improvements in technology have made these alternative environments attainable, but they don't exist because of technology. They exist because traffic has gotten worse and because people want to spend more time with their families and less time commuting. They also exist because organizations are looking to decrease the cost of their real estate footprint, because some workers find it easier to focus on intensive projects away from the office, because some outside workers only have an infrequent need for desk space anyway. Tim, in your work, what workplace expectations or ways of working have you seen change? I think the, the key thing here, Mark, is around work complexity. Um, that, that uh, we, we've, in this, this period of unprecedented change, that actually what we're seeing is that the, the biggest impact on employees is, um, is how complicated their roles are. And um, although we've got economists talking about a, a period of super specialization, um, that's generally not what we see within the database. What we're seeing is that, that for very many employees in the financial services and the, specifically in the, uh, the, the credit union sector, that, that jobs are just getting, roles are getting increasingly more complicated. And this, more than anything else, um, is, is the driver of a different or need for a different way of working. And we can see here across the whole of our database that um, the vast majority of employees are, um, are seeing their, their, their work complexity dramatically increase. So 46% of employees um, have a work complexity which we would argue a single desk will no longer be able to optimally support. So we're moving into a period really where a cubicle or a desk situation actually is, is going to become a, a shackle for somebody. It's going to become something that actually is, is complicated and holding an employee back in their, in their role. And this, this, this idea of work complexity goes way beyond anything to do with generations or genders. Um, it's, it's much more about the role that an employee has in an organization. So I would urge anybody listening in to just have a think about this more than anything else is that in, in the way that roles are developing as your organizations develop, just look at the complexity of them and maybe cast your mind back 10 years and think about how complicated that role might have been 10 years prior. Think about what it's going to be like today. Think about how fast your organization and the world outside is moving and just think five years ahead and think about how complicated that role might be by that time. Yeah, that's really interesting because in each of the last three credit union workplace projects we've worked on, there was a latent understanding that just the desk and office weren't cutting it for them and their ways of working together. They needed more flexibility and more choice, different tools in their workplace to support their ways of working. When we gathered the data, it was insightful for these teams to see the scale of the complexity of their work and how it was closely related to their need for a variety of work environments. Another interesting challenge credit unions face is getting the right people on the bus in the first place. Credit union think tank Feline thinks recruiting talented credit union workers is so important that they've created a center of excellence around it, dubbed the war for talent. Here are the facts. More people are retiring than are coming into the job market domestically. That means a growing proportion of workers will be from abroad. Just last year, the millennial generation eclipsed baby boomers as our largest population group. And Gen Y has been shown to be more selective than their employer choice. They are looking for purpose in their work, purpose that goes beyond their everyday work. People helping people, credit unions, are poised to connect with millennial workers on purpose. Your workplace can do a much better job of connecting workers to your organizational purpose. So now we've discussed just a few forces that are leading to change in the work your teams do. We've also briefly discussed how your workplaces can respond to support these changes. I'll now hand the discussion over to Tim, who's going to take a deeper look at how data gathered from your employee teams can help you deliver a much more effective work environment. 